Yeah, you should have um, access to advance. We gave you control. Okay, yeah, there we go. See if I can go back. Okay. So it's just after 12.30. I think we're going to get started. Um, and if you, if you have any questions throughout, I, I ask that you hold your questions. We have two speakers today. Um, first of all, I'm Donnie Alexander. I'm the, uh, I'm the program manager for environment and health here at the Alliance. And this webinar will be recorded. So if you have, um, if you want to refer back to it, we'll put it on our YouTube page. So our first speaker is Andy Grishop. He's an assistant professor at North Carolina State University in the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering. And his research focuses on the interactions between energy use and the environment. Um, and he will be re presenting some of his results from India and Malawi studies. So he, both he and the next speaker after that, Michael Johnson, will be presenting some of their results on field studies of black carbon emissions from traditional cook stoves and the intervention stoves. Michael Johnson is our second speaker. He's the senior scientist at Berkeley Air Monitoring Group, and he works um, mainly on field-based assessments of household energy projects, incl including studies on stove performance and usage, indoor air quality, personal exposure, and health impacts. And he will be presenting his results from various site lo locations, including India and Cambodia. So the, we'll have Andy speak for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then Michael will speak, and then we'll have 10 to 15 minutes for questions after. So Andy, if you want to get started, I think we're ready to go. OK, uh, thanks, Donnie, and hello out there. So uh, I don't need to introduce myself anymore, but uh, I'll just um, point out that a bunch of this work was done by students working with me, one who's in the center of this image here, um, Roshan Watore, who's, I think, on the line. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to give a little bit of background, but I didn't quite know what the audience would be, so I'm, I'm not going too into depth. So the, the basic idea behind the work that we've done is the, the question, can the stoves that are currently available or being used in current interventions provide the kind of benefits that we hope for from this kind of program? Um, and so I'm going to do a little bit of framing the problem, but I'm assuming that those of you who take your lunchtime to listen to this kind of know why we want to be doing this and what some of the impacts are. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that. But then the main section, main content, will be talking about a study that was done a bit earlier that the Global Alliance helped fund some of the final analysis of, of a carbon finance um, intervention in India um, and some of the emissions work we did there. And then <clears throat> recently work, more recently work that was done uh, earlier, or in end of 2015, looking at several interventions that are happening in Malawi. So all of these are interventions that were already taking place, and we're just looking at what in-field emission performance looks like. So um, you know, we, we understand that there are these impacts, uh, both in terms of climate and health. And the question sort of underlying this work is whether the types of interventions that are available or underway can actually provide the benefits we like to see, which is moving from this sort of upper uh, right-hand corner towards the, the ideal solution for household energy, which, which minimizes health impacts and climate impacts. And you know, a lot of what's behind this work is this idea that the, the provision of these alternative technologies or approaches can be subsidized by basically monetizing the reductions in climate impacts or carbon carbon uh, emissions or greenhouse gas or warming emissions. Um, so we have this po potential to reduce climate impacts and the potential to monetize that. And then we can then use that to, to subsidize provisions of things that, that provide other benefits for the people um, using the technologies. <clears throat> and as we all know, there are many different technologies that are have been developed or under development. This is an image that Jim Jetter at EPA provided me, and another one from, from Michael, um, of some of the different options. And I'm just going to focus on a few of these um, from uh, the, uh, the sort of very baseline technology to what, at least at this point, was kind of state of the art in terms of biomass, uh, biomass uh, 
stove, this uh, this Phillips stove in the lower right hand corner. Um, and the lab tests that have been done on these have shown that you know there's a very wide breadth of performance. This is a plot showing uh, again from Jim Jetter and others work at the EPA lab um, showing CO emission factors on the y-axis and PM 2.5 emission factors on the x-axis um, ranging from the sort of traditional stove in the upper right hand corner um, to um, a sort of range of what I will call uh, maybe controversially improved stoves which maybe do um, some uh, insulation, some improved air management, but um, but uh, but maybe and provide some reduced emissions in lab tests. And then at this lower left corner we have a set of technologies, um, both of these ga fan driven gasifiers that um, have you know more than an order of magnitude reduction in, in emissions of, of these species um, with res relative to the traditional stove. So we know that there's a wide range of performance um, and uh, the potential to to reduce impacts. Um, so I want to focus in on the, the particulate matter aspect of this, and in particular the carbonaceous particulate matter. Um, the, the impacts that we talk about in terms of health and climate are really driven by um, products of incomplete combustion, and a lot of them link to uh, particulate matter. So this is just a, a sort of mass balance on carbon in fuel, showing that of the around a half kilogram of carbon that's in a kilogram of wood, um, a pretty small fraction, so less than a percent, um, typically ends up as um, particulate carbon. So this is TSP, so this is uh, particulate of all sizes. Um, and, and of course we subdivide that carbonaceous um, aerosol or particulate matter into uh, two sort of coarse groupings, one being elemental carbon, which is uh, akin to the black carbon that was the focus of this, of this study in this webinar, and then also organic carbon, which is a, a mix of a whole bunch of other things that typically condense on the outside of black carbon uh, cores. <clears throat> um, and I just want to sort of step back and talk a little bit about how these classifications are done, because it it's obviously has relevance to a, a talk about black carbon. So we classify these things in a few ways, um, thermochemically, where we basically cook carbon off of samples. Um, and in different types of atmospheres. And that is a thermochemical classification that ends up with either elemental carbon uh, or organic carbon. And so these are ranked in, tor in, tor in order of refractiveness or basically durability under high temperature um, on, on this, in this left column. The other way that we classify these, these materials are optically by light absorption or, or light scattering. And so going from bottom to top on this right side, we have a transition from organics, which tend to be uh, colorless, um, the intermediate uh, sort of brown carbon organics that, that absorb in some wavelengths, and then black carbon, which is strongly absorbing across all wavelengths. And in terms of impacts, we're worried mostly about, most about this black or elemental carbon because it is strongly absorbing um, in the atmosphere. And we often think of organics, the, the lower part of this spectrum, as, as cooling or scattering um, optically. In terms of health, they're all probably bad, and we, I guess the evidence is probably inconclusive as far as which, as, which elements of these emissions are, are more or less responsible for, for health impacts. But obviously the focus here is on, on black carbon. Um, and just to give you an idea why, this is uh, some analysis looking at the 100-year CO2 equivalent um, climate impact from a year's youth use of stove. Um, so this is some analysis that, that we did a couple years ago looking at a range of different technologies. And just starting here, this is the climate impact due to fuel use by a, in a traditional stove, and the different colors mean different the, the climate impact from different species. So you have these striped, two diagonally striped bits are carbon dioxide, um, and it's split because we think about renewable or non-renewable fuel wood as having different impacts. Um, and then we have methane and carbon monoxide and um, non-methane hydrocarbons. But the one I really want to focus on is this black bar, which is the warming impact due to black carbon. And if you put aside CO2 for a minute, you say that you can see that black carbon 
from a warming standpoint, has by, by far the strongest impact. And this is over a 100-year time frame. If you look in the shorter time frame, that piece is a lot bigger. And this is really why we're focusing on black carbon from cook stoves, is that that piece is sort of tantalizingly large and should be easy to fix, right? Um, if you look at some of the alternative t technologies, and this is all based on, on available lab data from a few years ago, um, these orange bars are some different sort of improved, so that kind of middle category of stoves that I pointed out. And you can see that they reduce some of these emissions in some cases. So this is the Patsari um, uh, stove with the chimney. You can see it reduces black carbon by maybe 50% or a little bit more. But black carbon is still a pretty big chunk of the overall CO2, uh, carbon, uh, rather climate impact of these stoves. If you go to these gasifier stoves, which, as I said, was on the on the lower left, at least according to lab data, they have very small. So this uh, this furthest right is a is a gasifier or is a fan driven gasifier stove, the Philips I pointed out before, and you can see that it it really has very little um, black carbon emissions, very very small black carbon emissions, and really all the the climate impact or nearly all the climate impact from from this would come from carbon dioxide, um, which is kind of what we'd like to see in terms of ideal combustion. Um, if you add in fossil fuels, you can see, um, I'm just going to really focus down here on natural gas. You can see that the actual um, net carbon impact of fossil fuels will we'll focus on, say, LPG all the way on the right. It pretty much all comes from CO2, and it's actually smaller, depending on, on the renewability of biomass, is kind of on the same order or smaller than the cleanest of, of biofuel stoves. But this at least provides, this provides the, the motivation for why we're interested in these um, stoves as a way to mitigate climate um, in the near and the long term. Um, the, the question then is, if we, if we want to do that, we want to be able to monetize that, and we want to get the uh, health benefits from it, how do we do that? And this is the same data put in, in a set of axes with climate, so that same data from the last plot on the y-axis and a health, a sort of proxy for health impact on the x-axis. And there's a lot going on here. I don't want to go into it, but I just want to sort of point out that this is our sort of baseline. This is a traditional unvented wood stove. Um, and we have, you know, if we, want, we move down this sort of carbon impact um, axis, um, there's a real, really pretty wide range of different technologies that are available, but they're really either uh, these uh, modern fuels, LPG, or this, uh, these gasifier stoves that, that really go, um, get down. And, and in terms of the uh, at least estimated exposure impacts, you can really see that the, the modern fuels stand alone. But what we're trying to do with, with improved biomass stoves is sort of push these uh, dots to the left. <clears throat> um, but so what we'll be talking about later is, is looking about where that green dot actually sits. Um, but I'm going to sort of talk about this in, in chronological order. The first study that we did, and this is going back to 2012, was looking at, at an actual intervention being run by an NGO in southern India um, in Karnataka. And what the intervention entailed was replacing these traditional stoves, basically just clay rings, with a set of rocket stoves. Um, and the NGO Samuha had actually has approved, uh, CDM approved and gold standard approved. It's probably the first um, stove inter, uh, carbon finance stove intervention in India. Um, the overall coverage of the program is slated to be 110 villages. Um, and th what we did is basically took one pilot village and did an intervention trial there. And so that involved about 190 households um, over the course of about a year. Um, and I'll just back up to acknowledge that there's a whole bunch of people involved in this. It was the study was initiated by Julian Marshall, um, then at Minnesota, now at Washington, um, University of Washington, um, folks from University of British Columbia, some really amazing research managers in India, um, Krishma and Karthik, and then the participation of Samuha and village households. So this was a, a pretty big effort. I'm just going to focus on one little, little part of it. Um, Next slide. Okay. Um, so the, the the program overall involved studying a whole different bunch of different aspects. So adoption, uh, indoor air quality, outdoor air quality, some health outcomes, and and pretty detailed use of 
time use and livelihood among the, the community members. But I'm just going to be focusing on the emission work, so looking at a, a, a number of different species that were emitted. Um, having a hard time switching slides. Um, and the way the measurements were conducted was with this uh, system, the stove emission measurement system that um, that I developed um, as I was sort of starting at NC State. Um, and this is just a, a system to measure a, a series of gases, so CO, CO2, and particle properties in real time, along with collecting filters for PM mass and organic and elemental carbon, or OCEC. Um, the whole system was designed to be very autonomous because we were doing all these other measurements. The uh, social scientists really didn't want me in the household sort of monkeying around. So the idea was that this was set up and left behind. Um, and as a result, we don't have super detailed observational data of individual cooking method uh, uh, sessions, but we do have very good real-time air quality data. So this is just an image in a household, and so we're sampling with a probe similar to the, the, that developed by um, Tammy Bond and her group to sort of do plume average measurement from these stoves. So we're looking at actually two stoves at once in this case. Um, in most cases, and then the the stems, and this is a little bit distorted, but this was about a meter and a half above the the cooking area. Um, and this is what example data look like. So the blue is CO2, um, red is carbon monoxide, and brown is light scattering from our PM sensor. Um, and so you can see, you know, highly variable uh, a cooking session in this case that lasted about two and a half hours. Um, and then this is the light absorption data. So this is our uh, sort of our indicator of black carbon um, at three different wavelengths. In this case, um, you can see that it, it it has similar patterns to the absorption from or the the light scattering, but but uh, on the other hand, quite distinct in in some phases. Um, so in in overall in this study, we saw mixed adoption of the stove. So in about 40% of the cases, people only use one of the, the intervention stoves. And this is just a kind of a good example of that. You can see the, the second stove pushed into the background and used as a pot holder um, and a traditional uh, you know, stone fire set up in, in the foreground. <clears throat> in terms of what we saw in the field, um, I'll sort of walk through. There's a lot going on here. But we did. Uh, measurements in our control and intervention before the intervention. Um, and that's these bars on the left. And you can see, in terms of PM emission factors, we see highly variable, quite high, so on the order of you know eight or nine um, grams per kilogram of fuel um, uh, it, for, for both groups, um, for the median of both groups. Um, and if we look then over to the right side after the intervention, we can see one thing we see right away is that there's actually quite a big seasonal shift in emission factors. So quite a, a big reduction from our pre-intervention to post-intervention season within our controls. Um, here we have a, a, a central group, which is actually our partial adoption, because you know we don't we're not doing a single uh, single um, single stove test. We're looking at the sort of the combination of the two. And then on the right is, is the, the set of tests in which both stoves were the Chulika or the intervention test. So one thing you notice is that the emission factor, PM emission factor, is not that much lower. It's maybe marginally lower than the control group. We can do statistics on it. It's, it's basically uh, marginally, statistically significantly lower, but, but not much lower, still quite variable. Um, so that's another important sort of takeaway here. Um, and then the last thing I'll point out is I've, I've indicated some of results of different lab testing um, efforts. So from Tammy's group and Chris Roden's 2009 paper, um, the range of different tests, and then a test of this exact stove by um, a group at UBC um, showing that basically none of what we measured in the field overlaps with, with lab tests. So this is not surprising at this point. Um, given that, that other people have seen this in, in the field, but certainly uh, alerts us that, that lab testing on its own should not be, uh, should not be sort of, should be looked at carefully. Um, if we look at the EC, so I'm really going to be focusing on EC emissions because black carbon, uh, there, there are some issues with, with uh, 
quantifying black carbon in terms of mass. So I, I feel more comfortable talking about absorption measurements. So I'm just going to be talking about EC because it's a mass measurement. Um, and so what this is showing is for that second season, so this is taking out the seasonality aspect and just comparing stoves. And this is an EC emission factor. Um, so the, on the left is our, our season two EC emission factor. So you see a median of about half a gram per kilogram. Um, in our intervention, we see a, a factor of several higher um, EC emission factors. So this is about 1.2, 1.3 grams per kilogram um, for the same season. So not what we'd like to see if we're thinking about these stoves as, uh, as um, climate intervention technologies. Um, on the right, we just look at the ratio of EC to total carbon. So this is basically EC over OC plus EC. And you can see that the ratio in the field case is much, much higher. And so what we're doing here is reducing OC um, in the emissions and increasing EC, um, which is, in a sense, the opposite of, of what we'd like to do. Um, if we look at indoor, I'll just, I'm not going to talk much about this, but this is some indoor concentrations. Um, and as we'd expect, given that the emissions were not um, emission factors were not much reduced, um, we don't see much of a difference between our control and our intervention group in terms of difference. So this is a pr uh, pre versus po minus post. Um, so this is basically a difference in household uh, concentration for PM 2.5 and also for black carbon or actually absorption, um, absorbance from uh, filter measurements. So in both cases, you see actually an increase in concentration um, relative to or in the second season relative to the first season, a lot of variability and no real consistent effect of the intervention um, on either PM or black carbon. So take home points from this are that rocket stoves in the field were not highly adopted, um, minimal reductions in emission factors and stronger warming uh, on a sort of per emission basis um, due to the increase in elemental carbon. Um, I think some of the very interesting things that we're still looking at from these data are the, the large seasonality that we saw in emission factors, um, and also the seasonality between uh, in the link between emission factors and indoor concentrations. Because if you recall, we saw lower emission factors in the second season, but higher concentrations. And you um, have five more minutes left, and then we'll move on to Michael, OK? OK, sorry, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll get through this. So the, the second st study is, is uh, the work in Malawi. And again, these are interventions that were ongoing. The two, two that we studied were um, a, a uh, intervention being done by the uh, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine called the Cooking and Ammonia Study in southern Malawi um, with fan stoves. So they had both a Philips stove and then the one called the ACE-1, which is a sort of slight design update on the Philips stove being made in, uh, built in Africa. And then the second was an intervention by uh, Concern Universal, an NGO, using this clay stove called the Chititezo Mbaula. Um, so we did emission measurements uh, on these and, and traditional stoves in these areas. Um, one thing that was different in this case is that we were able to, uh, well, let me just point out, yeah, this is Rashawn, the student who ended up doing a lot of this work. Um, and some images of in-home testing um, and the equipment and sort of the, the testing environment. Um, and I'll just acknowledge Global Alliance for funding a bunch of people who helped with the logistics um, and field staff that made this actually come off quite well. Um, sorry, I'm not able to control this. Uh, OK, uh, so just quickly, we, we were able, because we were doing just emission measurements, we, were, we did pretty detailed measurements of fuel use. And what we see is that we see a pretty substantial fuel use reduction in the gasifier stoves, somewhat of a reduction in the Chititezo Mbaula, the improved stove. So it's kind of what we expect, and actually relatively similar to what water boiling tests that were done um, observed. In terms of emission factors, we, see, we saw, um, for, say, for CO, a pretty substantial reduction in the gasifiers. Um, this is the blue is the ACE and the green is the Phillips. So from a combustion standpoint, these should be about the same. We see a pretty substantial reduction in CO emission factor, but not to the same extent that was seen in the lab tests at the EPA lab. 
Um, these are emission rates, so we're basically combining the fuel use and the emission factor measurements. And you can see that we lie right around the sort of tier two to three range in terms of CO emission rate. Um, in terms of PM emission factors, we see, um, I'm just going to focus on the gasifiers. We see uh, not much of a reduction in terms of, P or certainly not a, far less of a reduction in terms of PM emission factors than we expected. You can see the lab tests again shown with the, the crosses. And so we saw, um, you know, a, a reasonable reduction in PM emission factors, say from the Philip, Phillips stove, but not. Uh, not nearly the sort of order of magnitude that the, the lab um, tests show. And if again, if we sort of translate that into an emission rate, we can see that the emission rate was sort of in the tier one, tier zero, tier one rate. So this is pretty disappointing in terms of PM emission factors, and certainly points to the fact that, that the lab tests are not reflective of, of what is happening in the field. Um, in terms of EC emissions, we again see an increase in EC um, both in terms of absolute emission factors. So in this case, this red being traditional, these two gasifiers, we see a, a, a minor increase in EC emission factor. And if we look at emission rates, we do see a, a, a stronger reduction because of the reduced fuel usage in the gasifiers, but you still see quite a high EC emission uh, rate. And again, the Chitty Detsonbao, the sort of simple improved stove, does not really look good in this regard. Um, the EC to TC ratio is substantially increased because um, you're predominantly making EC in these stoves. Um, the optical measurement, so looking at scattering and absorption, so single scattering albedo is kind of an indication of the, the sort of specific absorption of, of particles from these different, and you can see that the, all the intervention stoves have more absorbing particles um, than the, the uh, baseline stove. So the conclusions here are, you know, relatively minimal reductions in emission factors, at least relative to what we were expecting, um, larger EC to TC ratios. Um, and, oh, this is, I guess, focusing on the improved stove. Um, very, very predominantly EC in the emissions from these things as they were used. Um, and we have a bunch of real-time activity and aerosol data and user responses, and we also measured a, um, a handful of institutional stoves in Malawi that we're still working through. Um, but just to sort of close with this, this is an image of how the Philips was quite typically used, um, and the idea that um, folks are going to process fuel to the extent that is required for this kind of stove geometry is asking a lot, and I just think in the field not going to be um, realized. So, uh, sorry I used all my time, but thanks, and I just acknowledge some students and, and people that have funded different portions of this work. Thanks, Andy. Again, we're going to hold questions until after Michael Johnson is done, and we're going to switch the controls back over here to the room. Um, so maybe just one second, and we'll, Michael should just get started right now. I think we're ready to go. All right. Uh, thank you, Donnie. And Andy, great talk. I think you handled a lot of the intro material that I'm going to pass over. So that was really useful. So if Andy used a little bit more time, that's just fine, because I get to skip some of the stuff that he went over. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the uh, a bunch of field studies that we've done over the past few years that have provided a lot of <coughs> black carbon emissions estimates from uh, studies we did in Asia and Africa. And there are lots of people to thank. Um, I just want to highlight a few of the partners we had for this project. We had funding provided by the Global Alliance, also from uh, GIZ India. Um, we had Colorado State and the uh, Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi to help us out and field partners in Uganda, Kenya, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Um, so this is where the data is going to be coming from. Again, we did a lot of different field studies. We had a study in Uganda and Kenya, uh, a couple different ones in, in Vietnam. Uh, a couple different ones in India. So we have a fairly good geographic range uh, from this data. A quick overview of the methods. This is pretty similar to what to the approach that Andy um, described. In our test, we use an uncontrolled cooking test in which the user is not asked to alter their behavior in any way. We don't ask them to cook anything specific. They use their fuels, cook whatever meal they're going to be cooking. 
Um, and from this, we were able to collect over 500 samples from 19 different stove types. So it's a pretty big database, uh, which is uh, exciting to be able to look at from a big picture of what we're seeing in the field. Um, again, like Andy did, we used uh, the carbon balance with partial capture methods. It's not really feasible to put hoods in these homes. Um, so that was the approach. And then to estimate black carbon, uh, we looked at uh, the filters we collected and looked at the transmittance, or the amount of light that gets attenuated when you shine it through a filter. Um, and then Andy touched on this a little bit as well. It's hard to actually get at BC mass. It's, it's not a simple measurement. So we did kind of something similar to what Andy was talking about. We just assumed basically that the EC, the elemental carbon, was analogous to the black carbon for our purposes. And we calibrated our response from that attenuation to the EC uh, by looking at regressions by simultaneously collected measurements. Um, so, um, and the reason why this is important to kind of calibrate is because you do get different mass absorption um, depending on the aerosol that you're looking at. So, looking at these regressions, we got pretty good uh, correlations between the EC and the attenuation we th saw through the filter. Uh, for the data sets where we could make these comparisons in India and Cambodia, our squares of 0.84 and 0.9. So we felt pretty good about uh, this approach. Also, the, the slope, the relationship that we're seeing is pretty similar, which is a good sign. And it's actually pretty similar to what the default you know, factor that you um, convert from the attenuation to BC masses from the manufacturer of the instrument. Um, the other thing is we only had a subset of data where we could look at organic carbon as well, which is the kind of light scattering component. And um, because we only had a small subset where we could look at that, we looked at a bunch of other studies as well to see if we could try and predict what the organic carbon fraction was in the, in the samples. Um, and so we looked at a lot of data that we had from some reports we'd done also from the, the Roden and Tammy studies, and we combined that and plotted that. And, just by subtracting the black carbon from the particulate matter and seeing if that estimated the organic carbon, we came up with a pretty strong relationship. Um, so this gave us just a way to estimate what our organic carbon fraction was as well. Um, again, a pretty good R squared, uh, almost 0.9. So, um, so we use that to estimate organic carbon. So what did we actually find? Um, so this is pretty much all the data plotted here in the box plots. Um, and you have the black carbon emission factor on the bottom, and some grams per megajoule of the fuel. So we've normalized the, um, the amount of fuel by the energy in it, because we have some different fuel types. Um, and then we have different stove classes uh, on the y-axis. And so if we look at this just broadly, um, up top, those are all the traditional stoves, the traditional wood stoves. And I put a little box around here just showing where all the interquartile ranges are, are bunched. Um, and one thing that you'll notice right off the bat is that there's a lot of variability that we're seeing amongst these traditional wood stoves. So the traditional chula is quite a bit different from the three stone fire in Uganda, for example. And this means that if you're going to be looking at a specific project, you're going to want to know exactly what the emission characteristics of your baseline technology are. And Andy also pointed out that there are seasonal differences, right? So, you know, if we went back and measured these again in some different time, we might see them shift as well. So that's an important thing to consider. Um, but you see a lot of variability. But if we compare these to some of the different stove classes as well, the rocket stoves, you can see there's really not much of a, a difference in terms of the grams emitted per megajoule fuel. I um, mean, you know, it's kind of right in the middle of those traditional stoves. But then if we look at some of these more advanced style stoves, force draft, gasifiers, toplet up draft, um, pellet stoves, um, you see that the emission factors for BC that we measured were a little bit lower. They were on the lower side. Again, you see a lot of variation. These are different technologies. So you probably don't want to generalize to any one specific project, but you are seeing that they're reducing the amount of black carbon that's being produced. And then the charcoal stoves here at the bottom, um, you know, they definitely have low black carbon emissions. They have low particulate emissions in general just because of the way they combust fuel. Um, but they have lots of other climate implications as well um, because the way you produce charcoal creates a lot of particulates. Uh, they have lots of impacts on uh, uh, deforestation, so there are some some issues with, with charcoal beyond this. Um, but in general, what we're seeing is that the traditional stoves are emitting more black carbon um, than a lot of the other stove types. Uh, but you want to be very careful because each case is going to be pretty much project specific. If we look at these just grouped, if you group all the data, again, this is just an easy way to look at these different stove classes from what we've been seeing. 
Um, and I drew a line here through the simple wood stoves, the median of the simple wood stoves. Again, you're not seeing much of a difference in rocket stoves in general. That doesn't mean that will be the case always, but in general, um, the rocket stoves don't seem to be reducing BC emissions per unit fuel. Um, but the advanced stoves, they did seem to be doing that on uh, the simple charcoal stoves and the advanced charcoal stoves. Again, it's a, it's a different combustion um, kind of uh, way the fuel's being combusted, so it's going to be quite a bit lower. Um, but if we want to try and look at the overall climate impact, uh, there's lots of different things that you have to consider. So, of course, you have your traditional stove that you're being, that's hopefully being displaced by the new stove, and the displacement rate is an important component. Um, and then you have your emission factors, which we've been talking about, the black carbon emission factors and also the organic carbon emission factors. Um, and the organic carbon is going to cause a cooling impact, so it kind of cancels out some of the black carbon. Um, but then you also have the fuel consumption, right? So if you have a stove that reduces the fuel consumption as well, that's going to reduce the overall uh, emissions. And so all of these things have to be considered to try and figure out if you have a, a net benefit or not. Um, and there are lots of other things. This is kind of a simplified approach, just looking at the aerosol emissions. Many other things to consider, you know, what is the extent of the displacement, the geography, the weather. Um, when climate modelers do their models, they have lots of assumptions and inputs they need that go beyond just this particle size and, um, you know, what are the weather patterns, proximity to glaciers, all these things. Um, if co-emitted pollutants, brown carbon is something we haven't talked about much, but, you know, some of that organic carbon isn't just really um, white doesn't just reflect, some of it absorbs light too. Um, fuel renewability, there are other things to consider as well. But this is um, really the, the basic things you need to consider. What are the emission factors? What is the displacement? And then the fuel consumption. Um, and one of the ways that, um, and Andy talked about this a little bit as well, one of the ways that people are trying to monetize the benefits is, is by looking at the offsets. And I bet a lot of people are familiar with carbon dioxide equivalent uh, for carbon offsets. But there's a new methodology from the gold standard which does a similar thing for short-term benefits by looking at black carbon equivalent. So it's analogous to carbon dioxide equivalent. It normalizes the warming impact to black carbon's impact um, using IPCC 20-year global warming potentials. Right? And I've highlighted those at the bottom. You see that for BC, the 20-year global warming potential is uh, 2,000. 400 and organic carbon's negative 240. Uh, so, um, but it's negative because that's a cooling impact. So if you actually want to do the calculation, um, what you need to do is you got to take your emission factor, multiply by your fuel consumption, and then your black carbon equivalent factor. Um, and you do this for your traditional stove with your black carbon and your organic carbon. And that's what your black carbon equivalent would be before the intervention. And then you do the same thing with your traditional stove afterwards for the black carbon and the organic carbon. And then you subtract those, and that's what your um, net benefit should be. So if we go through this exercise and we look at some of the stoves that we've measured, um, we did this for the data that we had in India. Um, and we had the two field sites. We had Uttar Pradesh and West Bengal. And we've done this calculation to look at the BC equivalent. Um, and on the far left is the traditional chula. And the bars in the gray, that's the contribution from black carbon, and then the blue is the organic carbon, and that's why it's all negative. And then that stripe in the middle, that dark stripe in the middle, that's your net black carbon equivalent for the respective stove type. So if we just look at Uttar Pradesh, for example, um, and we I put that nice little line in there for the net um, BCE, the black carbon equivalent, you can see that for a couple of the rocket stoves, you're not getting much of a benefit. In fact, for the two-pot mud stove, you're seeing a, a kind of an increase in the black carbon equivalent. Um, but the rest of the stoves, they're either, you know, on par or reducing the black carbon um, equivalent. So, you know, some of these stoves, maybe not as good as others, but we're not seeing a big increase in black carbon equivalent. And then in West Bengal, um, again, almost all the stoves here are reducing the black carbon equivalent, which is a good thing, some more than others. Again, the rocket stoves seem to have kind of a marginal impact, but some of the more advanced stoves are reducing the black carbon equivalent pretty substantially. So that's a, that's a good sign. Um, the other thing that I want to touch on is uh, something that relates to the, the lab and field measurements and, and what we're seeing there. So what I've done here is I've plotted the particulate emission factor on the bottom and the percent of black carbon that's in the particulates on the y-axis. And what this tells you is that when you have low emission factors, when your PM2.5 emission factors are 
are relatively low, you're getting higher fractions of black carbon. So your aerosol is darker. You have smaller, blacker particles. Right? But um, out in um, places where there are lots of traditional stoves, you're going to see a lot more smoldering. Um, and here you get a lot of organic carbon. And that's your biggest emission factors are going to come from events where you have lots of smoldering and organic carbon being created. But when you look at the laboratory, and that's what these little orange dots show, now these are low emission factors, and generally they're much blacker particulates that are being created. Right? So we're not seeing that same kind of smoldering, uh, high emission events that you see out in the field. Um, so this is a really big difference uh, between our lab practices and our field practices right now. And, and um, hopefully we can figure out a way to reconcile those and, and test that a little bit better. Um, so just some concluding thoughts. Again, from what we saw in our studies, most new studies were reducing BC emissions, um, but the ratios of BC to OC can vary. And for some stoves, it can increase. In fact, for a lot of stoves, it can increase. But the climate benefits are generally promising because if you calculate in the fuel consumption as well, um, the net and the and the black carbon equivalent kind of uh, conversion factors, you end up with promising results for, for the climate. Um, again, as I just mentioned, a lot more smoldering in the field than in the lab, uh, and that has a lot of implications for trying to extrapolate what we see in the lab to what we see in the field, especially in terms of climate. Um, and then the other thing that's just important to point out again is that the BC emissions are a really important part of understanding the climate uh, uh, impact of these stoves, but you really need a lot of other inputs if you're going to have a full understanding. You need to know about the non-renewability of the fuel use. You need to know about the co species. You need to know about all these things. And, and I highlighted specifically here um, charcoal in the picture because this is a big one, the harvesting of, of charcoal. Um, and the production of charcoal has a big climate impact, and that's something that hasn't been studied as much as, as the direct uh, emissions at the, at the ESRAN. And so I think that's it. I'll turn it over to Donnie. Thanks, uh, Michael, and thanks, Andy. So what I'm going to do right now is open it up to the audience. I don't know if you can, um, Michael, make it so we can see the... Um, so we can see who's online. And anybody, if you want to just ask questions, right now we can't actually see people typing questions. So if anybody wants to just unmute themselves and ask a question, I think that's what we're going to have to do right now. And then um, if not, then I'll ask a couple of questions and we might have some questions here in the room. Oh, I, we do have two questions. So, um, okay. So the first question is from Jim Jetter. And it said, did room concentrations for an unvented LPG stove exceed the PM2.5 ambient air limit as shown on one of the slides? So I think this question is for Andy. So Andy, if you want to um, answer that, that would be great. Yeah, so I think this is referring to the sort of background slide I get with the different uh, the climate and health impacts. So that's, that's a modeling study. It's not measured. So that would be my... Uh, that would be, yeah, my my sort of, I guess, cop out for that. I don't, I don't, um, I haven't done those measurements. We're we're probably gonna end up doing a bunch of in-home LPG measurements as a part of an ongoing study. Um, but you know, I don't. My suspicion in in one of our homes is that's probably not the case. But certainly, um, during cooking events, it can be. But yeah, that's that's sort of a pretty simple model framework that was used to estimate those exposures concentrations and um, so. Okay, I don't, Michael. I don't know if you've done any work to to add on to that or not. We did measure some LPG emissions in Uganda, um, and the emission factors that we got were certainly low enough that you would expect, based on the modeling, that they would be lower than the um, than their quality guideline limits for the WHO, but. Um, and, and there, there are plenty of studies out there that I think have looked at LPG um, and or quality concentrations as well. Okay. We have one more question that was written. If anybody wants to write a question in, that sounds great. Otherwise, I'm going to read this question and then open it up for verbal questions both here in the room and on the line. Next question is from Charity Garland from um, Berkeley Air Monitoring, and she says, was there any indication what changed between the two different seasons that impacted emissions so significantly in both groups in India? So again, Andy, this is for you. 
Yeah, um, I mean, this is still stuff we're looking into a bit, but the, the main difference was, was season. Um, the, the second season was quite dry. It was the, the first season was sort of tail end of the monsoon, and the second season was quite dry. So we, we have fuel moisture data, and the fuel is a little bit drier, but not, it's not sort of a, I think, I think the, the mean, mean fuel moisture level was a few percent lower. So that's certainly one indicate one thing. Um, we need to look a little bit more into into fuel, the types of fuels that were were used. Um, but those are the, we didn't see a much of a difference in terms of fuel use, um, uh, in terms of the mass of fuel use, mass of fuel used. Um, but I think the, I think the probably the fuel moisture and species content were the biggest difference. Okay, I do have one question, Andy, about the fuel before um, I open it up here. I saw in one of your pictures that the fuel was just kind of shoved in there and it wasn't really used how um, we would use it in a, in a lab, a stove in a lab. So I imagine that that's why we see a lot of the variability that we see. But can you um, talk a little bit about how you think that may have impacted your results or if did you see women that were using the stove correctly, and did those results vary at all? I know the sample size is limited and maybe difficult to answer this, but I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that had a really large impact on on emissions. So there's the one picture I have at the sort of last slide, which showed the close-up of the Phillips, and you see basically these sticks kind of st sticking out and on fire, and so. Um, you know that that's really not being used as a gasifier. I guess now I'm seeing presentation mode, but you know I think you can kind of get an idea. You can see sticks sticking out. Um, I think there was a range in terms of how people use them, but I think um, in the in the vast majority of cases it was something at least for some part of the time like this. Um, and largely it was just that um, to process fuel to the size needed to actually use the stove properly meant a lot of extra work um, and so it wasn't it wasn't something that the the women that were that we were working with were sort of willing to do I mean we didn't ask them we just said you know as, as Michael indicated this was an uncontrolled cooking test so we just said cook you know do do what you normally do um, but that's what they would normally do and I think um, but we did see that you know people took out axes and sort of chipped up wood because um, a lot of the, the the fuel that they were using was sort of larger branches and logs, um, and it's a lot of work to get stuff down to a size small enough such that you can you can uh, get it to fit in that combustion chamber. Um, so I you know my my personal take is that if you expect people to do that without providing fuel or providing um, means to process fuel, then you can't, uh, this is probably more going to be what you see. People okay. have a lot of other stuff to do. <laughs> so is there, I, we have no more written questions. Does anybody on the line have a question that they'd like to ask? I think if they unmuted themselves, um, they could probably uh, ask a question. Okay, if not, then I want to open it up to here in the room. I don't know if anybody has any questions here. Um, oh, very loud. So the overall takeaway from Andy's study was a bit more negative than Michael's. So I was just curious, I know this is a hard question, but sort of what you guys think the differences were. Was, was it the technology, um, the fuels that were used, or did, was it just like a difference in methodology? Um, thanks, Julie. So I think that our results might be a little bit more similar than what the presentations may have implied. Uh, um, so I think we found similar things about rocket stoves that they're, you know, their climate benefits are, are marginal, if any. In some cases they can be, you know, a little bit worse. In some cases they might be better. And I'm guessing that if you look at the Phillips stove, for example, I'm not sure about the ACE. ACE looked a little bit worse maybe than the Phillips, but at least for the, um, for the Phillips stove, it looked like it was certainly having a beneficial climate impact because it was saving a lot of fuel. Um, so even though the ratio of BC to total carbon or particulate matter was going up for that stove, I would still guess that there's probably a net climate benefit if you use the 
kind of assumptions that are in the, the gold standard methodology for using 20-year global warming potentials. Andy, do you want to add to that at all? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't I don't think our, our results are actually that different. It's just more of a kind of a glass half full, glass half empty kind of thing. Uh, and I mean, I, I guess I'm comparing against a benchmark of, of maybe the, what the lab results show or what the potential is based on say you know LPG or something and if you if you say you know I think early analysis was saying okay well we have a 90 percent reduction in BC or these gasifiers um, you know provide these huge benefits and I think you know I, I haven't actually gone through um, and and done the sort of GWP kind of calculations that that Michael has done, but we will. Um, and I think we would definitely see a, a benefit. Um, I think it comes down to, is it what, you know, how does it stack up to potential, and how ca what can we do that that takes it further? Um, and I think things, you know, I think the Phillips stove using um, pellets or or a gasifier using using pellets probably shows a lot of potential. We just we didn't see those where we were working. Okay, that's good. So does anybody else here in the room have a question? So Andy, do you have any future plans to test other fuels, more processed fuels like pellets, and do some of the similar methodology to see what those results might look like and document them? I don't I don't have current plans, but I, I would definitely be interested in doing it. Um, I mean, it, I just have to find funding to go do more of it, basically. <laughs> um, but we have some of the gasifiers in, this, in the lab. We can do lab testing. And one of the things that we're working on based on this data, all of this data is, is and linking to what Michael closed with, is thinking of other ways where we can test these in a more representative fashion in the, in the lab. Um, so I, I'd like to do some more of it in the lab, but I, and I'd also like to look at some field some 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 sort of actual implementations and seeing how, how those are working out. So I'm going to answer just to, to Seema's question. Um, you know, based on some of the results that have been coming in, I think we see that there might be a need for looking at more pellets and also some of the clean fuels. So the Alliance will be releasing two RFPs sometime in the next month. Um, through UNOPS, so through the um, through the UN system, and one will be looking at um, pellet gasifying stoves, gas force draft gasifiers that use pellets, and the other will be switching, looking basically from the switch from kerosene to a, a cleaner fuel like LPG or um, or ethanol or biogas or something like that. So we definitely have plans to continue funding this type of work. Um, we're just going through uh, the, the process with UNOPS right now. Um, we do have one more question online that came from Ken Candela. Um, and what she said, she said, when talking about the requirement of additional data to have a full picture of the situation, could you explain this in more detail? Do you mean more types of stoves and fuels to be analyzed, different regions of the world, different types of analytical techniques, analysis of more co-pollutants? So I think, Michael, if you want to address this, that would be great. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, like I said in the conclusion, the black carbon and the organic carbon emissions are a really important part of understanding the climate implications of stove emissions and switching from one stove to another, but uh, there are lots of other things that go into what the net climate impact is going to be. Um, and so in addition to measuring a bunch of different technologies in different locations, the things that I think uh, you know modelers would like to see and the things that they put into their equations to figure out what is the actual net kind of what's the radiative forcing implication over time, um, they need to know things like what is the particle size distribution? Um, what about sulfates and nitrates? Uh, carbon monoxide actually has a pretty big impact on um, your climate forcing methane. Um, you know, figuring out the non-renewability of the fuel is big. The whole life cycle analysis of the stove and the fuel that's being used are really important. Um, so if you really want a comprehensive understanding of what the climate implications are for a given intervention. There are a lot more things to consider than just the organic and black carbon emissions. Um, 
but it takes a, a, a much larger study than what I think Andy or, or I were able to do in a lot of these places. And Bella, I hope that answered your question. Um, we have just a couple minutes left. I don't know if anybody else has any questions. All right, otherwise I just would love to thank um, <laughs> thank uh, the speakers. The, you guys put on a very interesting uh, webinar that really helps us understand a little bit about what the environment and climate impacts of these stove interventions can be. And clearly there's more work to be done in the field, but at least we're getting somewhere, so I really appreciate it. Um, and we will, of course, uh, put these presentations up on the website. Um, if they need to take out some of the results slides, I'll ask them to do that. But we will put these up as PDFs, and I can, of course, give emails if anybody has any, um, any more inquiries into this. So, again, thanks for joining, and um, uh, that's it, I guess. Thanks, Donnie. Thanks for organizing and inviting me.